Hello everyone, welcome to my channel, my name is Eva and this is a very exciting video because today I'm going to be talking about my favorite novel. Yes, you heard me right, this is not one of my favorite novels, this is my ultimate favorite novel. I'm talking about The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. I read this book last month and I was hooked. This is 1400 pages, like I never read novels that are this long but I had to make an exception because I was hooked and once I finished the novel I wanted to reread it immediately. Of course I didn't do it because there are more books in my reading list that I want to read before the end of this year but I was so sad to finish this novel. I think this is the first time that I feel so engage to read a story. To me this is the most perfect novel I have read. The story is a 10 in every aspect. The characters are great, the plot is amazing, the conflict is engaging. It is a story that spirits you away and sticks with you after you finish it. So because I have only read this story once, this video will consist of my first impressions and the opinions presented here are subject to change once I reread the story. I wanted to make a video discussing The Count of Monte Cristo because every time I read a story that I like, I try to listen to a, po a podcast or listen to a YouTube video or whatever, I just lo love to hear people talking about this story and just to hear their opinions because I feel like reading is a very lonely activity and it's good to have like to listen to other perspective to enrich yourself not only from the story but of what other people think about the story. But with the Count of Monte Cristo it was really really hard to find podcasts and discussions about it. So the purpose of this video is just to bring something more to the discussion. So without further ado, let's begin. As I have already mentioned, the story is really, really long, but Dumas managed to keep his readers' attention engaged. Nothing about the story is boring. The pacing is great. The descriptions are brief but evocative. Only with a few words of the narrator, you can have a, a clear picture of the setting. If you're planning to read the story or if you want to reread the story, be careful with the version that you choose because many of the versions in English are abridged and some of the translations are bottlerized because the novel was first translated uh, during the Victorian era and the purpose of the bottlerization was to avoid hurting the Victorian era sensibilities. And because we're not Victorians, I don't think those translations are good for us. So try to go for a modern translation of the novel. I personally read the novel in French and if you know French and you feel confident enough to read it in French, do it because the language is very accessible, the vocabulary is very easy to understand and the sentences are short. Before reading The Count of Monte Cristo I hated to read in French and now I think my perspective on the language has changed. I felt very apprehensive before going through this 1400 pages but now I have gained some confidence and some new vocabulary and I feel more at ease. Also something that I have noticed in some of the Reddit discussions that I have seen is that um, the version that the people read doesn't seem to be the same version that I read because of all those elements that I was just telling you. So yeah, try to go for a truthful translation and version of the story. One of the things that I like the most about this novel is how many gothic elements it has, especially coming from the gothic roots, like the gothic romance about adventure. And actually, the professor who wrote the, the preface for the version that I read explains how uh, Dumas took some inspiration from Anne Radcliffe's uh, The Italian. We have characters that are very common in classic gothic romances such as bandits and pirates. We also have some melodrama, intrigue, mystery and theatricality which are all elements of the classic gothic story. And my favorite part, we have a Byronic hero. Okay, so let's talk about the plot. The story is about Edmond Dantes, a young sailor who is wrongfully accused of conspiring with Napoleon and is imprisoned for 14 years. He manages to escape, discovers a treasure and he sets to avenge himself. 
He wants to reward those who try to set him free and he also wants to punish his enemies for accusing him. So we go on a journey with Edmund where we see his evolution as a person. He goes from being an uneducated, poor and good-hearted man to a ruthless and cynical anti-hero. He turns into a puppeteer, pulling invisible strings around him in a way that you only discover very slowly. He's incredibly intelligent and knows how to scheme. Edmund felt that God abandoned him and that Providence failed him. Because while he was in jail, his enemies became quite successful. So Edmund decides to take on the role of Providence. He wants to be the savior of his friends and the punisher of his enemies. To me, his revenge makes a lot of sense, not only because you see him suffer through his 14 years in jail, um, but also because the way that he thinks about it, um, we see very often in movies um, when people want to take revenge, they want to kill their enemies, but that never sits well with me. Death is not punishment, that's how I see it. And Edmund knows this, he makes a lot of sense. So he doesn't want to kill his enemies, he wants them to suffer like he suffered. Many people argue that this revenge is pointless because if you suffer so much for such a long time, why don't you just move on with your life? But if we put this story into context and we try to understand its themes, through a historical perspective, we will see that revenge back in the days was a honorable thing. That was the whole point of having jewels. And the Count of Monte Cristo has lots of them. I think it features two or three jewels. And I think it's just to remind us that this is a honorable thing. That when someone wrongs you, you have to fight for your honor. One of the most interesting things of this novel are its orientalist elements and how oriental culture is portrayed. Duma uses these elements to expose the hypocrisy of the European and Western society. Because Dante feels that his own system of beliefs failed him, he adopts a new one. In contrast to other orientalist works of the era, Dante doesn't adopt oriental culture because it is fashionable but rather because it gives meaning to his life. Through it, he understands that justice can be attained, just not in the way that he thought. Dante learns that when divine justice and law fails you, the only way to punish your enemies is to do it yourself. There are lots of Christian allusions in the story, but they, are, they mostly come from the Old Testament. And I think this is very interesting because it shows us the way in which um, Dante has adopted Oriental culture. It's not that Dante doesn't longer believe in God, but rather he believes in the God of the Old Testament, in the God that punishes those who sin, not in the God that forgives. He's also looking for an eye for an eye as a revenge. One of the most exciting parts of this novel is how much inspiration Duma took from Byron. And as someone who loves Byron, it was exquisite to read all those subtle and not so subtle references to him. Alexandre Duma loved Byron so much that one of the characters in the book was Byron's real life lover, the Countess Wiccioli. And she even mentions Byron in the story. She believes that the Count of Monte Cristo is a vampire because Byron convinced her that vampires actually exist. Now, the Count himself is a Byronic hero, and it's, he's more Byronic than Byron's own Byronic heroes. I think to me, the, he is the ultimate Byronic hero, actually. Physically, he has the looks like he is very beautiful and otherworldly. He doesn't seem to age. For obvious reasons, he's also a brooding man. He's also proficient in everything he does. He's ready to sprint into action all the time. He's the type of man who can do whatever he wants. Some people argue that the Count of Monte Cristo is the first superhero ever created because he has very acute senses and he has different hidden identities. He knows everything about everyone, but no one knows anything about himself. So yeah, I could see why people say that. The Count is also often compared to Byron's heroes especially to Manfred and Conrad. 
If you ever plan to read this book, I suggest you to read The Corsair. It is a poem from Byron and I think Dumas took lots, lots of inspiration from that poem to create this story. There are many similarities between the Count of Monte Cristo and Conrad, who is the protagonist of the poem. In fact, he doesn't drink and eat in front of his enemies and this seems to be an oriental custom. The Count of Monte Cristo also doesn't like to drink or eat with his enemies. Other Byronic skills that the Count possesses is that he is a master of deception, theatricality and illusion. He's an accomplished swordman and shooter. He's incredibly cultivated and speaks several, several languages. His power seems to be omnipresent and he is often compared to a god. I also need to talk about the queer elements that this story has because there's really really good queer representation. One of the things that caught my attention is that at some part in the story there is a thief cross-dressing as a woman and he cross-dresses to lure another character and this other character tries to kiss um, the thief and then it, it, it turns out it, the thief is not a woman but a man and when this character is rescued um, he's pretty fine with discovering that it was a guy and not a woman and his attitude is very cool with the whole situation and I feel like it really it's a really good depiction of healthy masculinity and there's a uh, another character and this part is way more interesting and her name is Eugenie and she's basically a lesbian. I mean it's subtle but it's not so subtle. She's often associated with mythological and real figures that are lesbian coded. Uh, for instance um, she's compared to Minerva and to Diana and her nymphs. There's also a Sappho reference in relation to her. She's really indifferent to men but there is this part where she sees a female character and she's shocked by her, her beauty. The story implies that she is clearly in love with her piano teacher who is a woman and she cross dresses at some point to escape her home. Now here comes the most problematic part of the novel and it is that the Count has two slaves. On the one hand I think this is to show us what kind of man he is and at the same time I think having these two slaves is part of the illusion of himself he's trying to create. Okay so first let's talk about Ali. Ali is the Count's Nubian slave. According to the Count he saved Ali when he was sentenced to have his tongue cut off because the Count wanted a mute slave. Now this to me doesn't make any sense because although the Count might be in need of having secrecy coming from his, his servants, he has lots of servants and most of them know his secret and are loyal to him. His biggest secret is his identity and no one knows about it. But his second most important secret is his fortune and his plans and schemes of revenge and most of his servants know he's up to something but they are loyal to the Count because they will inherit part of his money once he dies. He not only pays them very well but he also has put money aside to give something to them once they quit their job or once he dies. So to me it makes no sense for him to have a mute slave. Now as the story progresses you realize that the Count says lots of things to project a fake image of himself. He sometimes boasts in front of his enemies about having these slaves and to me with this he's implying that he's above the law because around this time in France you couldn't have any slave and any slave you brought into the country was immediately free under the laws of France. There is this part where they are talking about mistresses and the Count says that he doesn't need a mistress because he has something better, he has a female slave and all the people around him are shocked by this and they tell him like you, she's no longer your slave because you're in France and he's like yeah but who's going to tell her? She doesn't speak French, she's Greek. Although the comment is cruel, it's also very honest and I think this whole situation makes his enemies trust him more 
because they think they are dealing with a man who is transparent and they have nothing to fear from a man who is transparent. Now the reasons why I think the Count is posting and he's using his slaves to project this illusion of himself is that after that chapter when he's having that dinner and they're, they are speaking about the mistresses, he goes back home and he encounters his female slave and he basically tells her like we are in France, you are free to go, you can make your life here, you can uh, find a man for you and marry, do whatever you want. So. I mean, you see the contrast. He was lying in front of his enemies. So now I want to talk about Aide. This is the Count's female slave and she's basically a princess whom he rescued from a life of slavery by buying her into slavery. So the real reason why the Count buys her is that he, she is part of his revenge. But by being part of his revenge, she is also taking revenge against someone who wronged her. Um, he rescued her when she was 13 years old and at this point in the story she's 21 years old. Her relationship with the Count is very interesting because he tries to present himself to her as this father figure but she sees him as a man. The relationship the way I see it is more of a guardian gourd relationship because he treats her as a princess with the due respect that a princess deserves. So in that aspect, he feels that he's beneath her and there's that respect. Ade, on the other hand, sees him as a master because she is his slave. So she also pays him the respect that she thinks he deserves as a master. So again, there's that respect that doesn't allow them to be closer. The Count also treats her as a ward because she has her own space. They don't spend much time together. Um, she has her own servants and her own place in the house where to be. He also encourages her to maintain her culture and religion and language. He even learns her language and speaks to her in her language. She's always dressed as a Greek princess with lots of jewels that he provides for her and he basically acts as a protector, as a guardian, not as a father or as a slave master. I also like how much agency Ade has because she is in love with the Count but he doesn't take the hint. He tries to tell her that he sees her as a daughter and she replies that he's not her father, that if he were a father to her and something were to happen to him, she will survive. But she loves him so much that if he dies, she's going to die with him. She doesn't want to meet any other man because he's the most beautiful, beautiful man she has ever seen. Her love confessions are very obvious but the Count doesn't see them until the end. And the, the thing is like he is so heartbroken about his first love that he doesn't see himself falling in love again so he's completely blind with his own pain that he cannot see that there's someone there who loves him. I have read lots of discussions about the problems of the relationship. I don't see what the problem really is. There's indeed a power imbalance, but the thing is that the Count never imposes his power over Ede. She's not staying with him for his money. She can go away whenever she wants to and he will still provide for her. And at the same time, yes, he's much older than her. I think he's in his 40s when she's like, 21. But again, she's the one pursuing him from the beginning. They have both suffered in similar ways. They, ha they are both after revenge and I think they can understand each other because of that. So I think that's all I wanted to say about this story. I'm really happy that I found this book and that I read it and that I overcame my fears of reading lengthy novels and especially a novel in French. I highly recommend this story and assure you that you won't get bored. And I'm certainly planning to reread it and to make another video with more insightful comments. Please let me know in the comments if you have read The Count of Monte Cristo and if you liked it. Thank you so much for watching and for your support. I'll see you next week, I guess. Take care. Bye.